She had suffered unimaginable abuse for years prior to her murder, and in July of 2001, she was bundled up and dumped in the river. She was barely in her teens, but she had been stripped of her dignity, her freedom, and ultimately her life. Who was she, this girl without a name, this girl from the mind? Today's story takes us to Germany, and it's one of the most puzzling unsolved cases in the country's history. It was the 31st of July, the hottest day of 2001. The residents of Frankfurt were eager to take advantage of the good weather and to spend as much time as possible outside, gardening, playing with kids, and walking along the river mine. A group of people walking along the river in the suburb of Need at approximately 10 to 3 in the afternoon, spotted a brown bundle floating down the river. The bundle had been fastened to a white outdoor parasol or umbrella stand. Upon realizing that the bundle was a human body, the group called the police. The body was that of a young girl. She was naked, with her legs bent and pressed against her chest. Her arms were at her sides. She had been wrapped in a terry cloth fitted sheet, which wrapped around her more than once. She was then additionally wrapped in a brown leopard print bedsheet. The ends of the bedsheet were tied together, and then this was all fastened to the umbrella stand. The stand is designed to be filled with water or sand to make it heavy. It was clear to police that the perpetrator had intended for the body to be weighed down by the stand, but their plan had failed, since the stand ended up floating instead. It seemed to have floated from the neighbourhood of Griesheim to Nied. She had been in the water for between 12 to 24 hours, and had been dead for up to two or three days prior. She was between 15 and 16 years old, but she looked much younger, around 13, possibly due to severe malnutrition. She weighed only 38.5 kilograms. She had long, dark brown hair. Her eye color was not discernible. Her autopsy revealed a horrific story of years of sustained abuse. Her ear was deformed due to repeated trauma, known as a cauliflower ear. She had scars and cigarette burns all over her body. She had multiple old and fresh, long lacerations across her body. Bones in both of her upper arms had been repeatedly broken and had received no medical intervention, which resulted in the bones fusing in disjointed ways. Her cause of death was determined to be due to blunt force trauma, which caused her ribs to break and puncture her lungs and her spleen. She was not a virgin, and showed no signs of having been pregnant or having given birth previously. Both of her ears were pierced, as was one of her nostrils. There was no missing persons report that matched her. The police investigated the umbrella stand and the leopard print bedsheets, but it was determined that these had been mass-produced. The only real clue the police had to pursue was that the bedsheet had been fastened to the umbrella stand by two long woven fabric straps, one white and one white and purple. The police asked the public to come forward with any information about these strips of fabric. It was then determined that the strips were called nalas, drawstrings used in the traditional clothing worn by people from Afghanistan, Pakistan or India. The police tracked down a thousand young girls who could meet this description but they were all alive and accounted for. The girl was buried without a name on her gravestone. Authorities considered that she may have been employed in a diplomatic household, and investigations along this line were hampered by diplomatic immunity. Isotope testing of the girl's remains revealed that her ancestry was likely Afghan, Pakistani or North Indian, but that she had lived in Germany for at least two years prior to her death. Police put up posters and handed out flyers of her face and made translations into numerous languages and disseminated these materials among communities who were known to come from these countries, 
but still no leads were forthcoming. Since then, there has been no real progress on this case. I am using the available post-mortem photos of the body to create the sketch of the goal. I have kept in mind the stage of decomposition the body would have been in and the likely effects on the body. Taking into account what can be seen on the photos with regard to appearance and also the effects of decomposition, for example, the marbling on the skin, which would indicate microbia in the bloodstream, which would be likely accompanied by some swelling and bloating. I made adjustments to the appearance of the person represented in the sketch, taking this into account. If you want me to talk about this process in more detail in a future video, let me know. A sketch has previously been completed by a very, very accomplished forensic artist whose work I very much respect. And this is not a commissioned sketch. This is simply a different interpretation of the same post-mortem images. I won't post those images because firstly, I am not sure many people want to see them. And secondly, I don't think YouTube would appreciate it if I did. But for those of you who are curious, I will leave a link below where you can access the post-mortem photos for yourself. Part of the reason why I like doing these types of videos is because it creates the opportunity to really crowdsource information and knowledge from all over the world. So I'm going to talk about what I have learned and I really encourage those who are smarter and more knowledgeable about what I'm about to say to challenge, correct or add information. So please comment below. I really believe that knowledge is power and shared information and knowledge can make a really big difference to a case like this. So having said that, what do we know about the context for this case? A lot of this is assumption and educated guesses, but let's start somewhere. In Germany in general, and in cities like Frankfurt in particular, it's quite built up, so there isn't a lot of wide open spaces. There are people who can hear and see the activities of their neighbours everywhere. We can assume that the perpetrator had a car, otherwise they would not have been able to transport the body and the umbrella stand to the river without being noticed. We can also assume the perpetrator lived in the area to have had the knowledge of a quiet spot to dump the body. We can also assume that the perpetrator had access to a parasol stand, which would not have been missed by anyone else, which would indicate that the perpetrator had access to either a large patio or balcony or to a private garden. Now, private gardens are quite rare in Germany, and rent for a place with a private garden or a home with a very large patio would be higher. So we can assume from that that this person is fairly well off, probably with a well-paying job. The fact that neighbours did not report hearing screams or other sounds associated with abuse might mean nothing, but it might also corroborate the idea that this person may have lived in a standalone home so not an apartment building right on top of other people. And all of this might offer some support to the diplomat theory. Consulates in Frankfurt right now include the United States, Philippines, India, Ethiopia, Sri Lanka, Pakistan, Italy, France, Thailand, Nigeria, Japan, Lebanon, Colombia, Australia and Bulgaria. Afghanistan does not have a consulate in Frankfurt, only an embassy in Berlin. Are there cases of modern slavery in Germany? According to the Global Slavery Index, yes, there are. Forced labour exploitation takes place in domestic work due to the hidden nature of the sector. But that's not the most common form of slavery in Germany. Sexual exploitation makes up 90% of the cases of modern slavery in Germany. And lastly, there is the issue of forced marriage. The majority of individuals affected by forced marriage are women between the ages of 18 and 21 who have migrated from overseas or have been born in Germany to migrant parents. In 2016, it was estimated that there were between 50 to 60 cases of forced marriage per year in Germany. Child marriage is yet another factor to consider. In 2019, 819 instances of child marriage were reported in Germany. 
Victims in those cases came from countries such as Bulgaria, India, and Afghanistan. The girl from the mine could have been a victim of any of these. The fact that her family didn't report her missing and didn't seem to recognize her face might mean that they don't live in Germany or that they were the very ones who abused her. So that's another possibility. It is virtually certain that she didn't attain school because someone would have noticed her injuries and she probably didn't leave the house much given the extent of her injuries. If she had worked for a diplomatic household, she would not have been a very effective domestic servant if both of her arms were broken repeatedly at different times. As cold as this may sound, why would someone who had a slave inconvenience themselves by continuously injuring that slave to the point where they couldn't work? I guess it is possible, but it does seem a bit strange to me. I also looked at the demographics of immigrants from the three countries identified within Frankfurt. And I just want to preface this by saying that I am in no way associating child abuse or murder with these communities. We have all seen time and time again that anyone from any background is capable of these crimes. I was looking at this because I'm just curious about who the school was and where she and or her killer may have come from. Okay, so... Having said that, I looked at the demographics. Indians make up the largest Asian population within Frankfurt. As for the other two countries on the list, I found that it is reported that while there is a large Pakistani community living in Frankfurt, and that that appears to be where that community is actually concentrated, the Afghan community is concentrated in Hamburg. Of course, there is ample room for exemption here, and it's very shaky evidence, but if we look at statistical probability, it might be more likely that she and or her killer is from Pakistan or India. I also kind of assume that her killer is a man due to the cigarette burns on the body. The Nalas would indicate that this was a pretty traditional household, and I've been told it is frowned upon for women to smoke. However, the bed sheet with its leopard print might be more likely to have been selected by a woman. So it is possible that she may have had more than one abuser and killer in the household where she lived, a man and a woman. So that kind of makes me question that she was in a child marriage situation, unless she and her husband were maybe living with his parents. The two pieces of evidence I focused on most in reading about this case are the pierced nose and the nullas. I first looked at the nullas. I read a master's thesis by an Indian woman who was researching the cultural origins and the creation of nullas, also called azabans. The creation of these nullas appears to be an art form particularly prevalent in the Punjab region of India and of Pakistan. The appearance of the Nalas from the police photo also very closely resembled what she had in her thesis. She indicated that an average Nala is around 2 meters long, but that it would be tailored to the body of the individual person. In the photos that the police took, the Nalas appear to be cut. They have a measuring tape next to the Nala, and it seems that if they were cut in half exactly, the full length would be around 2 meters. Now, this may not mean anything, but given the small size of the goal, I do wonder if a 2 meter nala would have been hers, or if it would have belonged to the person who killed her and dumped her body. I also spoke to friends of mine who grew up in India, and they still have family there. They confirmed that these are mostly worn by women in the Punjab region. So again, there is a lot of wiggle room here, and I am admittedly reaching a bit, but if we go by likelihood again, this seems to confirm that we could be looking at households of Pakistani and Indian origin in 2001 in Frankfurt, whether diplomatic or otherwise. Now for the nose piercing. I very much doubt that this is a fashion statement in this specific case, given her life of abuse. So I tried to see whether the nose piercing would in any way help narrow this down. I found that in India and Pakistan, the nose piercing is very common. 
and that in many cultures it is an indication that the woman is either married or of marriageable age. And if this is the case with the girl from the mine, it throws the slave in a diplomatic household theory into question. Because why would she be by herself working for a diplomat if she was married and then pass away and not have a husband looking for her? I also read in my research, and I tried to focus on the Punjab region due to what I found out about the Nalas, that the majority of those living in India in Punjab are Sikhs. And it seems from what I read that Sikhs don't actually condone the piercing of the body. However, there are exceptions, of course, and of course, there is also a very large Hindu population in Punjab. So maybe, maybe with a stretch, this might indicate that Pakistan is a more likely country of origin for this goal. But this is a reach on my part, admittedly. I'm also by no means an expert. This is just what I've been able to find through online research and also by speaking to friends. I also found in my research that there is a stronghold of Ahmadis in Frankfurt. And this community actually originates from Punjab in Pakistan. So that also might corroborate the Punjab location theory a little bit more. According to German immigration data, only 415 Pakistanis were registered for employment in Germany from 1971 to 2017. We can assume, due to the car and the living situation I mentioned, that someone in this household was employed. So perhaps this could be a starting point for at least for process of elimination by the authorities. Although they may have already done this, or they may have thought of this and they have information that shows them that it's not a viable road, I don't know. I admit that it's a bit of a needle in a haystack situation. So, as I said, there are big gaps in my knowledge and I am making some assumptions, but I am completely aware of that and I admit to it. And I really want to hear from you if you have more information about what I've said or if you can correct some of my assumptions because I really wanted to talk about this case and just start the discussion and start crowdsourcing and spitballing some ideas with a global community of true crime um, aficionados or people who are interested in this type of thing. The more eyes we have on this case, the better. This girl was a human being, and I'm really glad she's no longer suffering, but she absolutely deserves to be named. And she deserves justice for the horrible, horrible life she lived and what happened to her. So please share this video and please share your knowledge in the comment section. And let's all do our part to really keep her story alive. Thank you for watching and I will see you next time.